We need to be an advocate. Stand up and speak for, but also help to facilitate. Encourage. Coddle if you have to. Encourage people that can't see. Help them to where they can. You know, crusty old religion ain't going to help anybody. But if you can get people turned on to reading their Bible, or come into one of these services where we're not, there's nothing wrong with a good song book. There are some great song books that are written. But when the Holy Spirit takes us into that place of worship and somebody experiences that, I'm just telling you, you can't shake it. It's like trying to shake gravy off of a chicken fry. It just don't happen. <laughs> You know, I'm not talking about physical vision, right? I'm talking about spiritual vision. We need to be an advocate so people will get more in tune with God, with what God wants to show them. You know, in the last days, the Lord's going to pour His Spirit out on all flesh. There's going to be brand new dreams. There's going to be brand new visions. I'm thankful that God's not done with us yet. I love that God still has a plan for the fivefold ministry. Do you know that there's still apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers? Oh, no, that went out a long time ago. No, my word says that he's going to give us that for the equipping of the saints so that we can all find our place in ministry until we grow up in all aspects, especially love. Until we love perfectly. Until we're all equipped, until we're walk, walking and moving in perfection, that's how long it's going to be before we get rid of the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And I just want to say this. There's people walking in those offices, and I believe every one of us, regardless of what seat you're in on the bus, regardless of what lane you're in, we all have some room to grow. We all have room to grow. And I just want to encourage you, when you see the flaws and spots on someone else, don't pick at them. Pray for them. Because you're planting good seed for people not to pick at you too. Amen. God wants us to increase in vision. God wants us to see things like he sees them. Do you know there's stuff God is doing outside of the realm of what these eyes can see? I mean, there really is. God's at work. His kingdom is vast. It's way bigger. It's way more spiritual than we think. That bad attitude, mm, well, it's way more spiritual than you think. That addiction, oh no, it's way more spiritual than you think. That hang up, that anger, that contention, it's way more spiritual than you think. That desire in you to run after God and fulfill that passion that He's placed inside of you, it's way more spiritual than you think. Why would we discount it as a, oh, that's just a bad attitude? No, may, maybe it's way more spiritual than you think. That thing that keeps capturing your attention, not in an aggravating way, but it causes your heart to leap every time you see a child living in a safe place, protected. It's way more spiritual than you think. When educators go back to true principles of character, of integrity, of honesty, of decency. It's way more spiritual than we think. If we could just have our eyes opened up and just see a little bit more of what God sees and help others to do the same. Probably the best story in the Bible where I see this is the story of when Elisha and his servant was surrounded by the king of Aram and his army. They didn't like Elijah or Elisha Many times when the kings were plotting to destroy the army of Israel, uh, they would say, okay, so here's the battle plan, and this is what we're going to do. And the next thing you know, the children of Israel find out the battle plan, uh, and then they would go a different way, or they would do something different. And finally, the kings actually got mad and said, who in the world is the leaker? Who's the leaker in this bunch? Because uh, uh, Elisha knows everywhere we are all the time. Elijah knows where we are all the time. It's funny, if you look at the life of Elijah and Elisha, most of the miracles were almost parallel with each other. It's, it's, it's interesting. That double portion thing was real. Anyway, 
So they say, well, uh, you know what? The Lord just reveals to the prophets, Elijah and Elisha, what you say while you're in, in your dressing chamber. Well, go get him for me. Go capture him for me. <laughs> so this is what's happening. Elisha and his servant are camping on the, just on the edge of this particular town. And uh, it doesn't say it, but basically the servant of Elisha gets up early in the morning to go to the restroom gets out of the tent and he's he's outside just taking care of business and he's probably honestly he's probably outside the tent just stretching oh this is going to be a great day i wonder what we're going to do today and he looks and he sees on the surrounding them around this entire area is the army of aram and he's like oh no what are we going to do let me read it for you second kings six fifteen. this is now when the attendant of the man of God had risen early and gone out. Behold, an army with horses and chariots were circling the city. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Would you be freaking out? Let me just ask you that. Would you, it'd be a pretty messed up deal, right? And so Elisha answered. And he said this. Oh, He says, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those that are with them. And then Elisha prayed this prayer. He said, Lord, I pray, open up my servant's eyes so that he may see. And the Lord opened up the servant's eyes and he saw and behold, the mountains was full of chariots and horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. You're intimidated by the enemy. I wonder if you would be, if you would see who's surrounding you as God is protecting you, guiding you, guarding you, running interference for you. Come on, give God praise. That's good. you got to see. The Word says that the angel of the Lord encamps around those that fear Him, and He rescues them. Some of the things that the enemy had planned for your life, God ran interference already. You didn't die of that overdose because God intervened. You didn't die in that car wreck. What car wreck? The one that you don't even know about. They didn't steal from you because God intervened. That sickness, God intervened. Mm. I want you to know, Jesus did not and does not pick and choose who he is going to Allow to see. Jesus doesn't do that. People mess up their spiritual perceptiveness all by themselves. The desensitization, we do that. God doesn't do that. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. He came for all people. Look at this. Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples in Matthew chapter 13, verse 10. And he explains it. Watch. The disciples came and said to Jesus, Why do you speak to them in parables? And Jesus answered, To you it's been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. For whoever has, to him more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because while seeing, they do not see, and while hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. In their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, You will keep on hearing, but you will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but you will not perceive. Here it is. For the heart of this people have become dull. With their ears, they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they would see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and would return, and I would heal them. God wants to heal them, but why don't they turn? Because their ears are dull and their eyes are dim. And I want you to know that's exactly what's happening in America today. There's a dulling, a desensitizing that is happening and has happened. You are what you eat. It's not only that way in your diet, physically, in programming, computer programming, but also in your spirit, in your soul. You are what you eat. The reason why murder doesn't bother us like it did people in the 30s, 40s, and 50s 
is because we turn on the TV. You cannot take one cycle through your cable TV channels. Anybody want to take this bet? Just cycle through all of your channels and you will see at least 10 people murdered before you can make it through the entire sequence of channels. Happens all the time. It happens when you turn on the radio, flip through the channels. Somebody's either getting abused or cheated on or killed or being desensitized over and over and over again. The reason why there's so much... um, I just want to be careful how I say this. The reason why there's so much of a low standard in uh, morality today is because when you drive down the freeway, how often do you see well-dressed people on billboards? No. They show on everything God gave them. Some of that needs to be covered up. We're being desensitized over and over and over again. And what God wants to do is he wants you to return back to that place that whatever breaks his heart breaks your heart. That's what he wants. That's when vision returns to us. He said, blessed are your eyes because they see in your ears because they hear. And then he says something, and many people misinterpret this because they think about what this next line is, is referring to something yet to come. But I believe it's referring back to even a long time ago, Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. People had that problem of losing their spiritual sensitivity even then. He says, truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it and hear what you hear and did not hear it. It didn't matter how far you've attained. It doesn't matter how far you've climbed up the mountain. What matters is, are you going to stay sensitive to God? Listen, you can take your eye off the ball and you can start slipping. You can get dull in your spirit. I think that's a, that's a tragedy to have tasted, to have walked in that place of intimacy with God and yet just fall away just because of carelessness. It's the pattern in the Old Testament. Go look at it. They would would be in a place of of an intimate place with God and prosperity and everything's going great. And then all of a sudden, here it is, they began to get careless. They began to give into the enticements of sin and flesh. And then they get so lackadaisical that all of a sudden now here comes the enemy coming to entice them, to enslave them, to oppress them to the extent where they turn back to God and God being the faithful God that he is, he delivers them. They move into that place of repentance. Then they move back into prosperity and blessing only to take their eye off the ball because of carelessness and lackadaisicalness. Then they soon begin to get back into the appetites of the flesh being oppressed depressed possessed then they get then they cry out to God again it happened over and over and over and over again what God wants us to do and this is there's a uh, a leader by the name of Josiah out of all the leaders all the kings he was the one that went into the high places and tore down every evil altar of Baal and Asherah he tore them all down But even after his life, he was the only one that did it all, that tore them all down. Then he started taking on battles that God did not ask him to take on, and it cost him his life. The greatest one even got careless in some areas. It's not a time to be careless. It's a time to be intimate with God. I believe the things that God wants us to do is not ones that you take out of violent, aggressive, physical force. No, it's about being aggressive in the spirit, about getting more, getting to be more and more like Jesus and showing the fruit of the spirit, walking it out, walking out love, joy, peace, kindness, meekness, faith, gentleness, self-control. That's what he wants us to do. He wants us to walk those things out and be the body of Christ that he's called us to be. You know, if you've ever wondered what, or at least part of what your mission is, You know what it is? It's to help people see if they can't. There's a lot of people today that can't see. They can't. They're blinded because of manipulation and persuasion and intimidation. They can't see. A lot of voices that are screaming out, this is the way, that's the way. What are they doing? They're just just blindly just following along. We need to find out what God wants for us. 
It reminds me of the story. Hans Christian Andersen, he wrote this many centuries ago, talks about the king with new clothes. You, are you familiar with that story? Let me refresh your memory just a second. There was this king a long time ago, and uh, his passion was for uh, the finest of clothing. He wanted to be on the cutting edge of fashion. Everything was just so, so, just so perfect. Well, there was these two swindlers that came along and uh, wanted to take advantage of the king and, and uh, basically rip him off financially. And they show up and they say, hey, king, we know you like fashion. We have this amazing garment that we've crafted for you. It's made with magical thread. And to the fool, you will think that it is invisible and non-existent. But to the wise... You'll soon see that it is made of the most luxurious magical fabric. And King, not wanting to be foolish in their eyes, they began to say what it's made out of and how beautiful it is. And the king was, oh, this is so amazing. Oh, I'm so glad I'm wearing these magical clothes. King standing there naked, wearing nothing. The king all of a sudden calls his, his, his noblemen, his officials, his cabinet. and said, oh, look at these amazing clothes. It's made out of the finest thread. And the first thing those guys were doing was like, Oh, but, oh, but here's the deal, guys. Listen, it's made out of this magical thread. And if, to a fool, you're, it looks like you're wearing nothing. But actually, it's made to the wise. You can see that it's made out of this fabulous, uh, uh, wonderful, magical material. And they're like, oh, yeah, king. Yeah, that's perfect. Oh, I didn't even know that that was like that. And uh, look how beautiful that. And yes, and oh, yes. Oh, king, this is great. And so all of them began to say, hey, Everybody in the countryside, everybody, come on in here and see, see the king's new clothes. And they all show up and everybody's kind of looking around like, mm-hmm. to the foolish, it looks like there's nothing going on here. But to the wise, it's fabulous and beautiful and cutting edge and nothing quite like it. And everybody's doing it on and thinking this is just such a great thing until this little boy shows up. He didn't, he didn't understand all of that. All he understands is just the plain and simple truth. He walked in. He sees all these people oohing and on looking at the king. He said, sir, you naked. <laughs> sir, you naked. Listen, so what we need is we need to have spirit eyes. Where when somebody's naked or something's messed up, where it didn't matter what anybody else says. When he said, whoa, 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 wait, uh-uh, naked. No, 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 messed up. I, I, I can't stand with that. There's a, yeah, get some, get some pants on, son. <laughs> I'm telling you, persuasion, manipulation, intimidation will cause you to see things in an inaccurate way. We need to understand that sometimes when God opens up our eyes, we can see things from a different perspective. And not one is right, not one is wrong, but you see it from a different perspective. So not everybody's going to see it exactly the same way you do. Do you realize God calls all of us and there's many different gifts. We are a many-membered body. So don't fight over the little details. It's what lane does God have you in? What is he showing you? What, what is he opening up your eyes to? kind of reminds me of the story of the three men that were late for the parade. The vantage point makes all the difference in the world. We need to stop fighting about spiritual things that absolutely will end in a, a no win. Three guys late for the parade, and uh, they couldn't be on the street because there was no room, but there was this fence that was right on the edge of the street, and the fence had these knot holes one was kind of high, one was kind of halfway, and the other one was low towards the ground. And there's other people that were late for the parade, and so they're standing behind these three guys that found the three knot holes, and they're looking through the, the fence. And they said, well, we can't see the parade, but can you describe the parade to us? About that time, an elephant comes walking past the parade route. And, hey, there's an elephant coming. Well, tell us what the We've never seen an elephant. Can you tell us what the elephant looks like? The first guy looks through the top eye Hole, the knot hole in the fence, and he sees the front face of the elephant. He goes, oh, elephant. Well, it's a big ears and eyeballs the size of a bowling ball, and, and he's got this long water hose big thing off the end of his face. Oh, ooh, that's what an elephant looks like. And 
elephant moves down a little bit farther and somebody else yells, well, 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 describe to me, an elephant, tell me, I've never seen an elephant. What does an elephant look like? Elephant's going a little faster. And so he says, well, um, it has this, in describing the backside of the elephant, well, there's this uh, really large backside and there's this, there's this skinny tail with a little tuft of hair. Well, that's what an elephant looks like. The elephant continues down the path. Hey, somebody else, uh, tell me, what, tell, describe, I've never seen an elephant. What does an elephant look like? And the guy's looking down low with the elephant's feet. He says, well, it's these, about the size of a tree trunk. But it has nails, like fingernails or nails on it, about the size of a softball. And they're all standing there like, wait a minute, which one is an elephant? They were all the elephant. But it was looking at it from a different perspective. And it just reminds me, that's where the church is today, right? The church is looking at the elephant and looking at the kingdom through different knot holes. And we're saying, we're saying, which one is right? They're all right. And be honest, we're all wrong in some ways. But realize everybody has a different journey. Everybody has a different perspective. But everybody needs to see. And those that can't see, that's who we need to help the most. You will multiply what you magnify. So many times in life, I, I see things like all of a sudden it's drawn my attention to, drawn my attention to. There's a time when I was thinking about planting um, certain trees in certain areas, and, and uh, I, I, I said, I wonder if a, I wonder if a, uh, uh, a Texas, uh, a redbud tree would grow well in a particular area. And I didn't know for sure, but I knew when the bl blooming budding season was. And driving through the area, never seen a red bud tree in that area or thought I'd ever see one. I drove through this one particular area, and they were everywhere. Because I know what the buds look like. They were everywhere. I've never seen that many red. Well, of course they're going to live there, but I didn't even know they were there. Why? Because I had never focused on that particular thing. Here's the thing, spiritually speaking, I believe this. In the time, the day, the age that we live in right now, God is going to start opening opening up your eyes to see things that have always been there, but you didn't see them until God opens your eyes. We need to pay attention. And there's other people I believe God's called to walk alongside of us. They may, they may have gone to church longer than you and actually may be more mature than you, maybe some less, but he's putting Joshua and Caleb's together. <laughs> he's putting Elijah's and Elisha's together. You don't have to see things exactly the same way. Let him open up our eyes together. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 22, look at this. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. And if that light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? I'm telling you, the time to grow spiritually is right now. Our eye, we cannot afford for our eyes to be messed up. We need to ask the Lord, Lord, clear, clear up my vision. Cause me to see. I'm telling you, we need to spend more time praying and asking the Lord to help us see things accurately. Hmm. I found a scripture a while back that I wanted to share with you today. This is when Job was going through his trials, nearly lost everything in his life. And Job's friends, after he loses everything, his friends show up. And the first thing they started, do, started doing was accusing Job. Job, I don't know what you did to tick God off, but you better fix that, Job, because you know what? You don't have much left. And uh, you know what? It's, it's time you repent. You better confess. You better get it right. I mean, three. They, I mean, these guys were just hammering him to the extent that also Job began to. And Job was a righteous man. He was uh, he, Satan goes before the throne of God, says, uh, and, and the Lord tells Satan, have you ever seen anybody that's got it more together than Job? Well, Job said, well, the only reason why he's like that is because you bless him so much. And he says, give me a shot at him. And the Lord said, well, you could take everything, you just can't take his life. 
And so the temptation thus, not temptation, but the trial begins. And so all of a sudden, everything starts getting ripped out of Job's life. And what's happening, then Job begins to cry out to God. Why is all this happening to me? Don't you see what's happening to me? I mean, there's not an argument. God, he's not disrespectful. He's, he's a righteous man. But he's crying out, why are you doing this to me? He's thinking that God's really, you know, by, you know drinking the Kool-Aid with the other guys are pouring him. Are you serious? Why, why is this happening to me? You know, God doesn't defend himself not one time. And there, at the end of this, towards the end of the book of Job, Job 33, 13, there's a, 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 the young one of the bunch. His name is Elihu, comes and he, sp- he says he speaks for God. And he says this, Why do you complain against him that he does not give account for all his doings? God never explains himself through all those trials. He says this, Indeed, God speaks once or twice, and yet no one notices it. Now pay attention to this. He says, in a dream, in a vision of the night, when sound sleep falls on men, while they slumber in their beds, then he opens up the ears of men and he seals their instruction. The Bible says he gives to their beloved in their sleep. I want to encourage you today to move into a new way in your prayer time with God. Take that scripture to heart, that he gives instruction to men in their sleep. The Bible says he gives to their beloved in their sleep. And what I want you to do, if there's things that are stressing you out, frustrating you, even angering you, what you need to do is when you lay your head on your pillow at night, try it tonight. I promise you this is awesome. I say, Lord, all of this in front of me, I have ideas of what I should do. But Lord, you tell me what to do. You got plans for me. Show me what you want me to do. And just begin to listen in your dreams. And he'll begin to tell you things. Hey, it's going to be all right. Oh, let that go. Walk away from that. He might tell you to quit that job. Please don't unless he tells you. He may tell you, oh, you know what? Hang in there. It's going to be all right. God knows the plans that he has for you. They're awesome. I just, what does God want you to see today? That's what I'm advocating for today is that you would see what God wants you to see. What is he pouring into you in the middle of the night? There's ever been a time when you needed to see what God wants you to see. It's right now. If there's ever been a time that we needed to pray for people that they would see things accurately, it's right now. Proverbs 29, 18, it says, Where there is no vision, the people perish, but happy is he that keeps the law. Matthew chapter 5, 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Matthew 5, 16 says, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. I'm telling you what, God wants to use you in such a mighty way Listen, he wants to use you in such a way that people will see it and they'll say, oh, 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 I want to serve a God like that. I want to have a life like that. Sometimes vision is caught not because it's taught, but because it's walked. We need to walk out vision. So how do we get there? Number one, here's the first thing we need to do. Jesus said, Matthew 7, 7. He said, be careful with that judging thing. 7-1, don't judge and you'll not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged by the standard of measure. It will be measured back to you. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but don't notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye. Behold, the log that is in your own eye. He says, you hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, then you'll clearly be able to see how to take the speck out of your brother's eye. We need to have integrity and we need to have credibility. Think about it for a second. Christian, will you please come up here? Please come up here. Please come up here real quick. No, no, listen, you got a, you got a speck in your eye. It's that eye right there. Okay, it's right there. Christian, I noticed there's a speck in your eye, son. And I just, listen, I want to help, help you get that. I want to help you. How, how can we? 
Seriously? Can't even get close enough. Why? Because of this log that's in my eye. Listen, there's some things I want to talk about I want you to fix. And it just isn't going to happen. So what you do, listen, you, you get this log out of your eye. And then you go over there and say, oh, there it is. There it is right there. Hey, listen, I'm going to pull your eye. It's right there in the corner. Now go ahead and get it. Go ahead and get it. Go ahead and get it. Boom, perfect. Yep. That's the truth. Deal with your stuff. Own your stuff. If you have that scripture on the back of your car that says, I'm not perfect. I'm just forgiven. I'm perfectly forgiven. No, that ain't good. That's not good scripture. Say, say, I'm a, you need to have a scripture. A bumper sticker that says, I'm a hot mess and I'm doing my best. <laughs> I'm working on it. I'm owning my stuff. Will you stand your feet? I want to pray for you this morning. <laughs> Take your hands and turn them like this and pray this prayer with me. Actually, what I want you to do is I want, to take, I want you to touch your eyes as a sign that God's touching your vision today. Say, the, say this with me. Say, Lord, help me see what you want me to see. Lord, remind me to focus on my flaws before I look at someone else's. Say this, Lord, if you allow me to see something in others that doesn't look like you, Help me to choose my words wisely so they will turn to you. Take your hands and turn them like this. Pray this prayer with me. I want you to know there's many people that come to River of Praise on vacation, visiting family, moving into town. Maybe God's called you here for the very first time or you've been here a few times. I want you to know there's never a perfect time for God to touch you and clear up your vision. But first, before He's going to give you vision and give you hearing, first He's got to be in your heart. This is so easy. Listen, God's not waiting for you to be perfect. He's waiting for you to receive His perfect forgiveness. This is an easy gift. and He wants to give it to you. Take your hands and turn like this and repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus... Today I confess, I'm not perfect, I've sinned, and I ask you to forgive me and lead me on the path of righteousness. Lead me, Lord, be my Lord and Savior from this day forward, for the rest of my life, for all eternity, I'm saved, I'm free, and I'm yours, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, come on, give Him praise, church.